Over the weekend on X, I saw a great thread from Lauren Murphy, a former title challenger in the women's flyweight division. So you went and took a judging and refereeing course in the state of Texas. What made you decide to go and do that? They don't offer them all that often, so it's a cool opportunity when you do get the chance. Yeah, um, a judge had randomly mentioned it a few months back. I was at a show, like a Fury fight or something like that, and uh, I had just stopped to talk to a judge that, like, um, somebody in the commission that always says hello to Joe and I, and he happened to mention that there was a judging and referee training coming up in May, and I was like, oh. And to be really honest with you, it was like, if he had not told me about it, I would never have known. And I'm on the email list for TDLR. And like, it was just kind of hard to find it. Like, it was not, it was not the most user friendly experience to like register and figure out where it was and figure out what time it started and then get out there. Um, <laughs> the commission could have done better about that. But yeah, I randomly heard about it from a judge and I just thought it sounded like a really good idea. And it was like 200 bucks. Um, it was taught by Blake Grice, who, like, as you know, is a super high level referee, has been in the game for a really long time. And um, yeah, so anyway, that's why I decided to. I just figured it would, it, what's it going to hurt? It's not going to hurt anything. I'm coming to the end of my UFC career. Um, obviously, I want to stay in the sport in some aspect. So whether it's coaching or being on the like officiating side or something like that, or being involved in the commission. Um, there's nothing wrong with like dipping my toes in, you know, and just getting as much knowledge as I can. Now that you've taken the course and you mentioned that you're towards the end of your UFC career, how much do you wish that you would have taken it earlier and known a lot of this information now? You know, to be honest with you, I knew a lot of the information. I was pretty proud of myself um, when I went in. I did have like some specific questions and I asked questions. I, I loved the discussion, first of all, but like I asked a lot of questions about stuff that had happened in my fights and things that I had seen happen like at shows and stuff. And um, it cleared up a couple questions I had, but um, I'm proud to say that when I walked in there, um, I already knew like the scoring criteria. I was very familiar with it. Um, I already was pretty familiar with like um, how referees like should handle things. I didn't know some of the nitty gritty details about like the second referees and what their job is. Um, some of the stuff about how to treat fouls I was not super familiar with. But um, f to be honest with you, as a fighter, I feel like it's it's helpful, it's entertaining, it's good to go out there and like have that experience, but it's really more for the coaches. If you're a coach in MMA, you need to take that course. There's no reason why you shouldn't because it's it was so informative about how to coach your fighters, like how to coach them and how they're going to be scored in these fights. Like you can't complain about a judge decision if you don't know what the criteria is, you know? So for me, I think it's more important for coaches to go. Y'all are about to meet my dog. She's gonna... What's your dog's name? Marge. Marge. They just always do this every time <laughs> I have an interview. They just want to be involved. Hello. Well, <laughs> so... oh, you're not paying attention to them, so that's natural, I guess, for dogs to uh, to jump in yeah. there. <laughs> I want to go back to another point that you made before. Uh, you mentioned that you were pretty well versed already heading into the course. Would you say that you're in the minority if you were to guess in terms of fighters and their knowledge of the scoring criteria and the rules of MMA? Yeah, so we did a really interesting exercise. Uh, I invite everybody at home, they can do this exercise right now. Um, Mr. Grice had us take out a sheet of paper. We didn't put our names on it or anything. And he said, um, you know, this was the first thing we did. Like, right, we introduced ourselves. Everybody talked about their combat sport experience. And most people in there were current judges. Some of them had been judging for more than 10 years. Okay, so I think out of the whole room of like 40 people, we had hundreds of years of combat sports experience between us all. Okay, probably one of the most experienced rooms in the world at that point in time. So we take out a piece of paper and he said, I want you to write in order the scoring criteria for an MMA bout. And um, we all did that. Um, I wrote it down. He came and collected everybody's papers and he quickly went through them and sorted them as to who got it exactly correct and who did not. And only about 25% of us got it correct. And that's in a room of people that have been judging currently and previously. And how is it that so many people in that room 
got it wrong? How is it that so many people in that room did not know the criteria? So that's an exercise you can actually do at home if you think you know like what you're talking about when it comes to judging, write down the criteria in order and then look it up and see if you got it right. See how close you were, you know, because things like defense is not a criteria. Um, and definitely like some people use that to score rounds. It's not a criteria. So um, that was a really interesting exercise for me. And I was definitely in the minority in that room alone of people that knew what the scoring criteria was, much less people that have never taken the course. And what do you think that is? Because if you look at the scoring criteria, really, you just need to know, I think, like two paragraphs of it for scoring around in terms of what you're looking for as the primary criteria, because the secondary and tertiary criteria almost never come into play when scoring around. So why do you think mm -hmm. it is that so few people have an awareness of how fights are scored, whether it was the people in that room or just people generally that watch the sport? Uh, well, I think the UFC has done a better job now of like putting what the sky scoring criteria is up on the screen for the viewers before the bout. Like they, they were doing that for a while before big pay-per-views, like this is the scoring criteria. And you know, it's effective striking, effective grappling, aggression and cage control in that order. Um, and then if the fight takes place mostly on the ground or whatever, then you're going to score the effective grappling, which includes damage, you know, um, and then if it, the fight takes place mostly on the feet, you're going to um, score effective striking, you know, which the main component of that is damage. So it's like, um, I think people just get really confused where they're like, well, yeah, he took a lot of damage, but you were controlling the cage, you know, and it's like, that doesn't actually matter. Um, it, like if the first criteria have been met, then you don't even go into the tertiary, you know, the secondary and tertiary criteria. And I think people don't realize that. Like, um, I think people don't know a lot about uh, scoring effective grappling. Like I was a little bit surprised on what effective grappling constitutes as well, you know? And I think a lot of people miss what that actually is. And so, yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons. And that's why we spent two days going over it about, you know, what are the, what are the nitty gritty of like, what is damage actually? And what is a 10, eight round and what is effective grappling? What is it? You know, how do we define that? And, um, it was really, it was a fascinating conversation. Well, it's fresh in your head, so I'm going to ask you, what is effective grappling? Because uh, I think that that's one of the things that people are having a lot of trouble grasping when it comes to watching mixed martial arts and, and understanding exactly what judges are looking for in that specific facet of the game. Yeah, I agree with you. And um, just I'm about to go off on like seven side notes here, but um, try to keep me on track. <laughs> but Blake Grice did a great job. He repeated it over and over. Like, if you do not practice grappling or jujitsu in some form if you do not practice it you will not be an effective judge period because you won't know what's going on anybody can look at a striking match my mom could watch a striking match and generally know who's winning the guy who's bleeding the most is losing and the guy landing the most hits is winning right it's not that hard but in grappling it can be very different the guy on the bottom might be winning the guy on top might be losing the guy on top might look like he's close to doing something great and it might be nothing at all and vice versa it might look like like nothing is happening and to a experienced jiu-jitsu practitioner they might know that oh that guy's really close to getting a knee bar or that guy's really close to getting a choke so it's really important as a judge and a referee to know what grappling is first and foremost and there were a lot of people in that room that did not grapple and had no like real life experience grappling there were a lot of people in that room that were elderly, um, had been judging like 10 plus years. So before MMA was really, really big, there were a lot of people there that were former boxers that were now judging MMA and they, they just didn't practice jujitsu. So I don't know how they passed the test. I don't know what they do about that, but I know for sure that there's not enough grappling knowledge. Just from being in that room, my opinion is there's not enough grappling knowledge in the judging community, right? Not yet. It's it's coming. Like the generation that grappled and can now be a judge, that's coming. But we got to like we got to get rid of the old people first that never did grappling that are now judging. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me. I mean, I passed the course, so I, I took the course at the yeah. Association of Boxing Commissions, and I personally don't think I would be an effective judge. Like I think I, I have a grasp for what the judges are looking for mm -hmm. and, and what how they're going to score rounds. But personally, I think if I was sitting cage side scoring rounds. I don't know how effective of a judge I could be because I don't feel like I yeah. have the requisite hands-on knowledge that would be necessary. Like I had enough that I was able to pass the test and, the, you know, enough mm -hmm. that I was able to, um, you know, when they were walking through the different positions in the refereeing course, understand what was going on. 
uh, understand what was being set up and, and all of that. But at the same time, I, I agree with you. I think that it's really important that people that are judges have a certain number of years or somebody that can at least vouch for them that they've been doing this in practicum for some time. So sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, but it brings up a really good point is what is effective grappling? So um, the guard is now considered like not quite neutral that like somebody on their back using their guard effectively is using effective grappling anytime you make somebody defend a submission whether it's from top or bottom that's effective grappling anytime you sweep your opponent that's effective grappling um smothering your opponent tiring them out a clean takedown that's effective grappling stopping a takedown if you're a striker and you sprawl and you stop a takedown clean and continue your game plan of striking that's effective grappling so now you can say that that fighter is effectively striking and effectively grappling they're winning on both of those criteria um yeah i mean obviously damage is like the biggest thing it's the biggest criteria. So, and damage can be like, not just making somebody bleed, it can be making them carry your weight. It can be gassing them out. It can be diminishing their spirit, which I feel like Khabib is like a super good example of a grappler that gets in there, he gets on top of you, and maybe he's not cutting you, making you bleed, but he is visibly exhausting his opponents and breaking their spirit. And um, anyway, Khabib came to mind a lot when we talked about like, how effective grappling doesn't always mean that they're going to be bleeding. Uh, Mackenzie Dern is another good example of an effective grappler, even on bottom. She's always going for submissions. She's always looking for sweeps. She's always making her opponents defend. Um, that's effective grappling, even from bottom. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Does that does that answer your question as to what effective grappling is? Uh, yeah, certainly. I think that it's good as even as a refresher for me to remember what a lot of these things are because. I think that the word damage is not even in the criteria, I don't believe, until you get to the 10-8 section. I don't think the damage is mm. really even brought up. But I, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of people, myself included, sometimes you'll see a round where somebody's dominating the striking for the first 45 seconds. They get taken down and mm -hmm. neutralized for the rest of the round. It's like, who wins that round? I think that a lot of judges might see things differently in, in those situations. And that's another thing about judging. It's not really black and white. Like, there's, there's not really a definitive winner of a close round. And I think that, did you watch the uh, the PFL this past weekend? Or Bellator, I guess it would be. Bellator Ch Challenger Series or whatever it's called. Uh, now I know no, they changed the name a bunch of times. But the Patchy Mix versus Magomed Magomedov fight was just absolutely fascinating for that reason. It's because uh, Oh, really? I'll go yeah. back and watch it. I really like Patchy Mix. I'll go back and watch. Yeah, so a really interesting fight to score from a judging standpoint. In fact, I think that coming off the course, that would be a good one for you to watch. I won't give you any spoilers, but just, just know that it is a close fight. Um, you look at certain examples of these fights where uh, rounds, I think, can be judged both ways. Like, I think that uh, there's a chance that a judge is sitting in one vantage point where they see something another judge doesn't see, and that's mm -hmm. why there are three judges, is because you have three unique yes. vantage points, and if one judge misses something, hopefully the other two will have gotten a better look at it. And that's really, I thought Blake Grice did a great job of letting us have so many discussions. And it was really, I mean, I had my mind changed about a few things in that course. Um, and when you say like damage is not a criteria, but that's what effective means, right? If we are effectively striking, we are damaging our opponent. If we are effectively grappling, then we are causing damage to our opponent, whether that be, you know, diminished spirit or bleeding or bruising or poor body language or whatever it is. And so... Um, we got to have the most fascinating discussions about, and we, he, he would have us watch very close rounds. He would have us watch people have very dominant rounds, um, that maybe didn't get judged correctly by the judges that had actually watched it. Um, it was really fascinating and he would have us like, okay, who thought the red corner won that round? And we would raise our hands and he would say, well, who thought the blue corner won? And then, you know, some people would raise their hands and we would have to actually get up and justify why we thought that person won the round. And, um, you know, we had to, he was like, let me give you a tip. The best way to start these sentences is to say, like, according to the criteria, I believe this fighter won because, you know, and once we had to start, like, saying that, like, according to the criteria and looking at the criteria, it became very different because you can't judge the fight as a whole, which is a very natural thing to do. Um, you know, you have to take the whole round into consideration, which is also very hard. Like if one fighter's winning for four minutes and then the other fighter comes back and has like a hell of a minute to end, um, 
you know, who it, it was really fascinating to hear the different opinions on who then was more effective in that round. Um, and sometimes we would all disagree and he was like, that's okay. You guys can disagree. That's what we're here for. We're here to learn and talk and grow and, you know, hopefully become unified in what we're seeing. What do you think was the most enlightening thing for you in this course? Like, what did you learn that you would say going into the judging course, you, you didn't really know, or perhaps, you know, were taught during that course? Yeah, uh, well, I learned a ton, but the biggest thing that stuck out to me, a few big things, was that the commission, um, like the judges are actually held accountable for their cards. I didn't know that. Um, and I've always been like big on Twitter about like, how come they never have to justify their decisions? Why don't they ever justify their decisions? And um, it turns out they do. They just don't justify them to Twitter. <laughs> they just don't justify them to the public, you know. Um, but the commission does keep track of every scorecard that is handed in. And if there is a judge that is way off the mark and dissenting all the time, they're going to go back and they're going to review those fights and they're going to review those cards. And they will sit those judges out. And so um, in the referee and judging world, a lot like the fighter world, you can make it to the big shows. You know, if you do well, at a lower regional level and you are properly scoring fights and you are doing well as a referee, um, then you, the commission is going to sit you at bigger and bigger shows. And then eventually you can make it like to the big show, you know, and be on TV and be scoring big fights or be refing big fights, you know. Um, and I, I didn't realize all that, you know, it's not just you go through a course and you're hired and you kind of do whatever. These people are actually very um, there's a lot of oversight over these people, not just in the cards that they score, um, not just in the way that they ref, but also like how they, um, you know, who they talk to, um, how they associate with the other people, like the coaches and the athletes, like I, there's a lot that goes into it that I didn't realize. And they're far more accountable than I knew. Before we go to refereeing, one last thing I want to ask you about judging the scoring criteria. What do you think needs to change about it? Like, obviously it's been in practice for about eight years now since 2016 is when they brought the new criteria in and what would you like to see change in terms of judging overall like is there anything I think that if you ask judges this they all have an answer to this everybody might have a different one but I think the current system works but I think it could work better yeah, so there's some ideas like um, like open judging, which I don't really have an opinion one way or the other about. Um, you know, I think there's like good points and bad points to that or judging the fight as a whole, I think like and those are things some other promotions are trying. One thing that I think would help. Um, yeah, first of all, everybody's got to do jujitsu. Like everybody, just, it's like if you're gonna be if you're gonna be in mixed martial arts, if you're gonna score mixed martial arts, if you're gonna ref, if I'm like, if you're gonna coach, if you're gonna be in it in any official capacity, you fucking need to do jujitsu. I don't care how old you are. Go find somebody that can work with you, that can teach you these positions, that can help you feel these positions. Like it's half of what we do as mixed martial artists. Um, secondly, I I don't understand. I still think that the commission could. I still think judges could be a little more accountable to the public and to the fighters for their cards. Um, I understand that they get questioned behind closed doors. I'm not saying that they need to do press conferences, but maybe on their scorecard, maybe they could just circle one of the criteria about why they thought that fighter won that round, you know, or something, make a little note, but it has to be something to do with the criteria. Do you know what I'm saying? Because there have been some rather egregious scorecards. The one I always think of is when, um, Jan Blakovic fought um, Alex Perea, and there was one really, really bad. Um, there was one really bad round turned in that basically cost Jan the the championship. And so when I think about that, I'm like, how come that judge did not have to answer to the people that he affected for that? I would have loved to have known why he scored that one round the way he scored it. You know, so I still think there could be a little more accountability to the fighters and to the public if there's a very egregious scorecard turned in. Yeah, I've talked to some commission heads about this, and Andy Foster's been very proactive. He actually has um, the meetings with the officials after the event that are open to media if they want to come, uh, which I think oh, is great. Oh, yeah, and then the media can come. Yeah, that yeah. is great. I really like that because I, I, I personally 
want to know like why you know like i don't mind hearing why i want to know though why did you score it for red it can only help the sport it can only help the fighters to know what the judges are looking for and another thing i learned at that course was that a lot of judges at least at the regional level or a lot of people in that class um they would keep notebooks with them um and as they were like watching the fights they would make little notes like i don't can you see my hand i'm writing with the wrong hand mm -hmm. they would make little notes like um about why they thought which fighter won that round. So they would be like, okay, one minute big knockdown uh, at minute two, big combination or whatever. And they'll just make little scratch mark notes so that if they ever have to go back and justify, they'll be able to read like, oh, this is what I was thinking at that time. You know, surely like if you judge five fights in a night, you're not gonna remember who you like, you know, that could be whatever, 15 rounds that you watch, you wanna go back and talk about the seventh round you saw that night, you're gonna need some reference to know what you were thinking at that time. Yeah, if it were me and I was running the commission, I would say Wednesday after the event, do a, a Zoom hearing or something where you just, the judge kind of lays out what they saw from their vantage point, you know, goes over their notes and that's it. Like no questions, but just having the ability to explain why they saw the round that way, I think would, would do a lot. And especially on like a Wednesday when the dust has settled a little bit and people aren't all hungry yeah. for blood. <laughs> so I think that would be. Yeah, 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 I agree. I agree. And maybe both because I know for sure uh, Blake was telling us a lot of times they do have those breakdowns um, after the shows. I'm so glad that Andy Foster is like inviting the press in now so that there can be more accountability. I think that can only go up. You know, I think that we're only going up from here as far as like getting everybody unified and together. And like I said, there is a whole generation of judges out there that don't practice jujitsu because they were boxing judges. They went into mixed martial arts and they, for whatever reason, didn't have the time or the skills or the, the youth to, to get into a sport like grappling, but that's being phased out. So thank God. Yeah. And the other thing that I don't like is the 10 point must system overall, I think could use some refinement mm. in MMA. I, I think a half point system would be, a lot better where you have 10 to nine and a half for a close round, 10 to nine, 10 to eight and a half for a round that's a pretty clear round, 10, and then you, you go down 10, eight, 10, seven and a half, that kind of thing that gives the judges a little bit more latitude in terms of their scorecards. But I also know that math mm. has been hard for commissions to do for whatever reason, sitting cage side, and we don't want to keep Bruce Buffer waiting in the cage to uh, have somebody tallying up numbers. Uh, calculators, I, from what I understand, are very hard to find these days. So uh... I agree. Okay, <laughs> that's crazy because everybody has one in their pocket. But I, I agree because... Um... You know, the ten, I don't have an opinion on the 10-point um, must system because I don't have an alternative. That's really the only holdback. I don't love it either. I think it's a little archaic. I don't think it quite fits the sport the way it needs to. Um, but I don't have a good alternative. <laughs> so I'm all ears for people that do, you know. Yeah. And I think that the more suggestions we can get about, like, I don't know, half points or advantages or yellow cards or whatever we need to do to make the point system you're right, more applicable to MMA. And um, hopefully in the next five years, we can, you know, maybe in the next 10 years, this will all be a distant memory. Yeah, you're like you're taking a boxing system that's for six, nine, 12 round fights. And I think it works best actually for the five round fights in MMA. I think it actually works pretty well for. It's the three round fights that I think the round, the nuances in certain rounds where you have one really dominant round and then two really close rounds and the fighter that wins the two really close rounds that loses the dominant round can still win the fight, I think is a little bit, I, like you know, you said, kind of archaic. You're very right. Yeah, that's a very real situation. And it's like, sometimes you have to remember that uh, this is a fight and people tune in to see the fight. So uh, Blake Grice talked a lot about like, what's best for the fighters, the sport and the fans, you know, and we want to make decisions that are best for all three so that we can grow the sport, make it enjoyable to watch, um, keep the fighters safe and entertained, you know, and grow the sport worldwide and globally. So we have to make decisions, even as referees, like, um, and as commissioners, that it's like, what is best for the fighters, the sport, and the fans, you know? And, and now quickly, I've taken a lot of your time on ter in terms of uh, just overall, but I want to quickly talk about the refereeing course. What did you learn from the refereeing course, and uh, <laughs> what, what are your biggest takeaways from that? Because I took that course, and I thought that was uh, very eye-opening, and I, I feel like a lot of people, like as much as people don't know about judging, I feel like referee procedure is something that people know even less about. Oh, yes, me included. I was like, this is going to be much harder. I was much less familiar with um, like what the referee's job is, you know. Uh, I know it's a lot harder. <laughs> and um, I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm friends with Jeff Rexroad, but he's a, he's a ref here in um, Houston locally. He's ref 
uh, my UFC fight here in Houston and my legacy fight that I had here in Houston. Um, I see him at a lot of shows. And so he was at the course. He didn't need to be there. Um, him and Joe Solis both came and they didn't need to. They were just there to pick up little pieces of information, continuing education, stuff like that. Um, and I talked to him at length and it's just so it's such a hard job. There, there's so much pressure on referees to get it exactly right. Um, you have the fighter's actual fucking safety in your hands. You have to really know what's going on. It sounded like as much pressure to be a ref as almost there is to be a fighter. I mean, you're not hopefully getting hit as a ref, but you are responsible for two people's life and limb. You know, if you get it wrong as a judge, you can fuck up their career, their money. It's things like if you get it wrong as a ref, I mean, somebody could fucking die. That is a lot of weight to carry. Um, on top of that, you're doing it in the ring with the athletes. So the spotlight is, you know, a bit on you as the third man in the ring. That's a lot of pressure to deal with. Now, underneath all that, you have to know every single fucking rule. You have to know how to apply it. You have to know how to apply it on a minute's notice. You have to know hand how to handle bizarre situations. Like if you're in an outdoor show and it starts to rain, what if the cage door breaks? What if the floor of the cage breaks, but they're able to fix it in five minutes? What if it takes 20 minutes? What are you going to do if there's no stretcher available? Do you cancel the whole show? Like, I mean, just there's so much to think about as a referee and how you interact with the commissions and how you interact with the fighters. You have to have a lot of um, personality management skills, <laughs> you know, a lot of personality management skills. Very hard job. I could go on for probably an hour and a half about all those things those guys do that I didn't really realize. What would you say the biggest one is? Like, what's the thing that you learned the most about the referee, like from the refereeing course that perhaps you didn't know before? I think the thing that I hold closest to my heart is that, uh, you know, being a ref and just as in the fighter world, in the referee world, you can make it to the big show. So, you know, if you do a good job as a ref at a lower level in the amateur shows and then the regional shows and then with the regional pros, you can make it to the UFC as a referee. And that is like making it to the big time. You can... Um, say you've made it you know as a referee the same way a fighter would probably feel that way and so um if you're a referee probably that's your goal is to make it to the big show and uh there's a lot of refs that don't there's a lot of really bad refs out there there's a lot of people that shouldn't be refs that maybe can pass the test and they they take a fight or whatever they're in a fight because the commission needs them but uh, not everybody's going to make it to the big show just like not every fighter is either you know what else would help referees a lot a half point system because they can deduct points more freely, you deduct a half point. Because deducting a point from a fighter could be a death knell for that for that particular fight. Like if someone grabs the cage and still gets taken down, and you take a point away from them, like that is very detrimental to a fighter's chances of winning a three round fight. But if you could only take a half point away, I feel like the referees would answer what the public says is a big criticism of theirs, which is not taking points away for fouls. Because yes. yeah, like taking up taking a full point away from somebody, you're basically they have no chance of winning that round now, save for a ten eight, which is you know, the very, very rare occasion that you get a 10-8, which is yes. probably 2% to two of the time you get a 10-8 round. Yeah. If you were to look at every round, maybe it's a little more than that. But I, I feel like the referees would have a little bit less trouble taking points away if they could take away a half point. You know, I think that's really true. I think you're really making a strong case for the half point system, you know. And um, I, I, like I said, I don't know. I don't have any other ideas about the point system. I keep thinking, my mind keeps going back to jujitsu where they give like advantages, you know, um, but they, they also take points in jujitsu. But anyway, um, I just think we should keep discussing it. Um, Sean Madden was a big proponent of open scoring. He told me that he thought like a great way to do open scoring would be to do open scoring for the first round, open scoring for the second round, and then for the third round, you keep it a secret so that like if it's close, people don't know who won. You still have that excitement that builds up, um, but people can still coach based on the scores that they're getting during the fight, you know? So I thought that was kind of an interesting solution. I love the half point um solution that like you're talking about right now i think it's just going to take people having these discussions going to the commission meetings getting on these calls with the commission which i believe are open to the public aren't they these like csac meetings that are on zoom i think like people can just tune in if they want to know more um the, and there are courses all the time you have to go to abc boxing i think it's abcboxing.com or something like that um and you can find trainings in your area, but I would highly recommend finding one taught by Blake Grice or Kevin McDonald because it's a 
it's a great course. Blake Grice did a great job. He did a great job. And um, I understand Kevin, Kevin McDonald has a good one too. So yeah, the resources are out there if we want them. And I, you know, hopefully this is how we make a difference. Like if you would love to see that half point system, like keep going to the meetings, keep talking about it, keep making your voice heard. Like eventually people will start catching on and it will like gain traction. You know, that's how change is done. Yeah, I, I had uh, Blake teach the referee course that I took. He was amazing. And uh, mm -hmm. I had Kevin McDonald do the judging course, and he was excellent as well. So it was uh, oh, really awesome. a really educational time at the uh, the ABC conference. And they, they do that every year at the Association of Boxing Commission con uh, conference. I believe it's in Louisville this year. So if you're uh, yes. in that area, feel free to, to pop by. I think it's a great learning experience. Um, before we wrap, Lauren, you've been, with, uh, I guess, withdrawn from the UFC rankings due to, I guess, it's inactivity. Um, so mm -hmm. w what's going on with you in terms of your career right now? Uh, yeah, so after the Andrash fight, I took some time off. I was like, mm, that was pretty hard loss. I wasn't, you know, you know, fighters just need some time to regroup and recollect. And then um, I started a business. I started an aquatic fitness business out here in Denver, or in Denver, in Houston, which I love. And um, my husband opened up a Henzo Gracie. So between the two of us, we're, we've opened two businesses out here. Um, like I said, I was like, you know, looking into... Um, like judging, roughing, coaching, those kinds of things. And then I really got the itch to fight again. I was like, okay, I have two fights left on my UFC contract. Um, I would love to fulfill at least one of those. You know, I'll be 41 this year, but I still feel very athletic. I still feel very good. Um, I feel like I'm still getting better. Like, I, I want to I do it one more time. Like, I want to feel the rush one more time. Um, and unfortunately, I broke my leg. So <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, today I walked for the first time. Today I've been walking around for the first time. And I'll be um, six weeks out in about a week and a half. So, um, yeah, I would like to get back to training. And I would like to fulfill uh, one more fight in the UFC. So um, I'm hoping before the end of the year, I hope before the holidays <laughs> yeah well that would be great and i don't know if they're planning on coming back to texas but it seems like they visit texas fairly regularly so that would be a, a good place for you to have your potentially final fight i mean I, i'm guessing if you feel good and you get a win you know who knows <laughs> how much longer you uh, you plan on doing it for i mean seriously like our our knowledge of recovery and like our the technology that we have now is getting you know it's getting pretty advanced where it's like i, I do feel really good i feel better now than i felt when i was like 32. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. It's like I keep telling people like I keep getting older and my opponents keep getting younger. <laughs> so <laughs> but, um, you know, I think like a fight with somebody like Priscilla Cachoeira would be super fun, especially here in Houston. Like, God, that would be a fun fight, you know, or um, who's the other girl that I always wanted to fight? Um, King King Casey. What's your mm -hmm. name? Casey O'Neill. Uh, yeah. Casey O'Neill. Yeah, I always thought she would be a fun fight. So just you know, like, yeah, I, um, I, I want to fulfill at least one more and I want to retire as a UFC fighter. I don't want to fight anywhere else. I never want to fight in any other organization. I'm very, very proud of my career and that I spent most of it in the UFC. And yeah, I would love to go out in style with one more win. As you should be. I, I hope people give you the kind of credit you deserve for having a very underrated resume and career overall. I think if people go and take a look, they'll, they'll know what I'm talking about. And of course, that is if they haven't watched you fight already. Uh, and a lot of new fans <laughs> coming over to the sport that I don't think uh, have seen the different things that you've done in the UFC and some of the, the big wins that you've had over your career. So uh, go and take a deep dive. I, I, I urge you to do that. And I also urge you to check out any sort of judging courses that could be happening in your municipality. You know, if you're going to complain about judging and refereeing, you think you can do a better job, hey, your commission is one phone call away and you can go and take the tests and, you know, put your money where your mouth is. So uh, I yeah, appreciate exactly. you going, Lauren. I think that this was a great conversation and uh, nice to see uh, fighters like yourself go and take those courses. And I agree with you in terms of uh, coaches. I think that it's even if you go to Mark Goddard's course online, if you're a coach, you can just download yes. it and watch it at the gym with your fighters. And I think that everybody could learn a lot from that, like, you know invest it in your gym and your team just a little bit it doesn't cost a whole lot of money and i think that they will go a, a long long way for your team yeah i agree i agree yep you just gotta uh, put the ego aside and go learn a little bit and it, it can really affect the way that you coach your team and you know maybe you see the number of w's on your team just start going up and up and up higher percentage of wins you know you never know can't hurt it definitely can't hurt awesome lauren well thank you so much for your time i really appreciate this thanks a lot aaron i'll talk to you guys soon